let's get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining another Q&A session with uh, Thesis Capital. Um, today, we will cover Pluralock Security. For those that don't know, Pluralock Security trades on the TSXV under the ticker PLUR, P-L-U-R, and on the OTCQB under the ticker P-L-C-K-F. Uh, my name is Prit Singh, founder of Thesis Capital. Uh, our presenter today will be Ian Patterson, CEO of Pluralock Security. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A function. The present, after the presentation portion, we will have a Q&A function with all of our attendees. If you would like to submit questions, you can do so by opening the Q&A screen and typing out whatever question you have. Alternatively, if you are dialing in today, you can send us your questions by email at info, I-N-F-O, at thesiscapital.ca. With that out of the way, I'd like to turn the call over to Ian Patterson, CEO of Pluralock Security. Thanks, Britt. And good morning to, to those of you on the West Coast. Good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast. Nice to see some familiar, uh, familiar well, names, if not, if not quite faces. Um, so like Britt mentioned, Ian Patterson here, CEO of Pluralock. Um, we're going to go through the, the presentation. We did put out some, uh, uh, some news this week, and so certainly happy to get into some, uh, some questions uh, at the end uh, in regards to that. Um, with that out of the way, uh, I'll just confirm that, uh, Prit, you can see me changing the slides. Yep. Good. Excellent. So standard disclaimer, uh, please take a chance to, or take a minute to, uh, to read over this, take a screenshot if, if need be. So the big news, I think, is that cybersecurity continues to be in the news. Um, you know, it, it seems like the, the colonial pipeline uh, attack was, was eons ago, certainly. Um, you know, it was actually just a, a couple of months ago. And there's, there's really not been any shortage of uh, cyber attacks, be they ransomware or, or be they other, um, that, that are affecting all of us. And as we saw with the, the colonial pipeline attack, um, there are uh, dependencies today on IT systems um, whereby uh, a, a pipeline uh, provider, if, if they were to get hacked, could actually affect uh, your ability to go get fuel at the gas station. Um, now, what wasn't uh, immediately publicized around the colonial attack was that the way the bad guys got in was through a compromised uh, password. And so this could be from uh, the bad guys stealing a password. It could also be from the bad guys guessing uh, an easy to guess password. Um, I'm, certain, I'm sure everybody has at least one friend who uses the password, you know, password eight as, as their login password. But at the end of the day, what, what, what we're trying to articulate here is that um, a compromised password can have serious downstream repercussions on the ability for a company to function and then ultimately for that company's customers to be able to, to consume those services. Now, Pluralock as a company is designed to empower our customers to defend against attacks exactly like this. And so we'll talk in a little bit more detail about uh, specifically the identity focused attacks. Um, and so just keep, keep uh, companies like Colonial in mind um, as we go through today's presentation. So we'll talk a little bit also about just the, the size and some of the, the key drivers in the cybersecurity industry. So depending on which, which statistic you look at, cybersecurity is, has been described as a, as a trillion dollar um, opportunity. And that's, that's the cumulative spending estimated over a five-year period. Now, the, the reason for that spending uh, is several fold. Um, what we're seeing, particularly in North America, is that there is a massive shortage when it comes to labor. Uh, there are not enough qualified cybersecurity workers to do the jobs necessary to stay safe. So the estimate this year has been three and a half million cyber jobs unfilled. Last year it was over a million jobs unfilled. So problems getting worse, not better. Now, compounding this, the average enterprise will have approximately 120 or more security vendors that they work with in order to stay safe. So think of a firewall, antivirus, uh, monitoring system, log management system. These are all coming from different vendors. And so the, from the enterprise's perspective, it's very difficult to, uh, to take all these uh, different point solutions, assemble them into something that's actually uh, integrated and that works, and then deploy it effectively. 
And then when you consider that there's also a lack of qualified people, it becomes very difficult to, to stay safe. And so I think that these two uh, drivers combined are really leading to this third driver, which is that in 2020, last year, there were more data records compromised than in the last 15 years combined. So all of this goes to show that this is an industry that has uh, a lot of attention on it today. Certainly there are a lot of reasons why uh, cybersecurity is, is a, a good one to be familiar with and, and be aware of. Um, and it's part of the reason why um, you know, we're, we're very uh, excited about the, the opportunities ahead for Plurlock. So for those who, who have not been following the, the cyber stories recently, Cyber attacks are becoming much more sophisticated, particularly over the last five to 10 years relative to what they looked like maybe 15 or 20 years ago. 15 or 20 years ago, a cyber attack was frequently uh, a, a, a guy in his basement uh, who, who defaces a website um, and, and is doing that for notoriety. Now that sort of thing does still happen, but what we're seeing more and more is that the level of sophistication on behalf of the cyber attackers is increasing. And the economic incentives for those attacks to take place are also increasing. So what that is causing is the attackers are, are becoming much more sophisticated and able to, um, to, to, to really think more in terms of different phases of an attack with potentially different threat actors participating in those different phases. So, what does that actually mean? Well, to give you an example, um, a typical cyber attack is going to um, be divided up into a couple of different phases. There is a, an initial access phase where the, the attackers are looking to somehow get access to the, the, the company systems. That might be from a stolen password, as we saw with the colonial example. Might also be that they uh, exploit uh, an unpatched server somewhere. But generally speaking, they're gonna find a way to get in. Once those attackers get in, they'll seek to establish persistence, which means they wanna be able to come and go as they please. From there, they'll start to expand laterally. They'll start to do reconnaissance throughout the network and really try and identify what are, these, what are the sensitive systems and what are the sensitive data that they can uh, take action on, either steal or encrypt with ransomware or disrupt in order to, to try and extract value. From there, they'll act on that and then they'll exfiltrate. The, the, the key here is that today, organizations are, are really trying to uh, solve for this entire attack, uh, uh, attack chain. And what Plurlock is focused on doing is, is really those, two, those first two initial phases. So we're looking to prevent people from getting in to begin with, and we're also looking to prevent them from being able to gain persistence and then move laterally. If we can do that, then that means that those attackers, even if they do figure out a way in, uh, are still prevented from acting on or, or conducting any damage. So Plurlock today is an AI cybersecurity company. Um, we're broken up into two divisions. We have a technology division where we build and market uh, patented AI software. And then we also have a solutions division as a result of a, of a recent acquisition. Uh, today, staff is, is just over 40 people and we currently trade on the TSXV under the ticker PLUR. Uh, we also cross-listed on the OTC exchange in the US earlier this year uh, with the ticker PLCKF. Um, as of our Q2 uh, financials, which were our last financials put out, we had uh, 4.9 million of cash on the balance sheet. And while we're based uh, principally in, in Victoria and Vancouver, um, we are, uh, uh, as, as most companies today, we're 100% we're remote and distributed. So I'll, we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the, the technology division, because this, this really is the, the core essence of, of the Plurlock um, uh, intellectual property. So we've we've talked about uh, uh, cyber attacks. We've talked about how they occur. We've we've mentioned that um, in in a good number of cases, those attacks take place because there was a, an attacker who was able to impersonate an authorized user. Now the traditional defenses against that are called uh, multi-factor authentication. And generally speaking, multi-factor authentication or MFA for short is a, a way of proving an identity to a computer when you go to log in. 
So a password, as an example, is a way to prove your identity. You are presented with a prompt, you type in a, a secret, a shared secret, like a password, or it could be a PIN number, and that proves the identity of you as the individual to the computer. That typically will happen a couple of times per day. And our view on this is that that whole interaction could be made a whole lot more secure if we're able to extend the time where we're checking the identity of the user. So we have a product called Pluralock Defend, which provides continuous authentication. So based on your behavior, how you type on the keyboard and move a mouse, we're constantly checking uh, to make sure that you are in fact the right person continuously throughout the day. We recently closed uh, a sale uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we put this out as a press release with a large overseas financial institution. And they were, they were principally concerned with uh, remote workers and they wanted to make sure that they had good confidence that it was the right remote worker because they weren't coming into the office. So as a result of testing our system, they ultimately opted to, to purchase on a three-year uh, three purchase, uh, three-year contract. And what they were able to find was that using our system, they could detect an intruder within a minute based purely on their, their keyboard and their mouse behavior. So another way of thinking about the, the Defend product is think about, um, think about a house. And most people have a deadbolt on their front door, which provides pretty good security. That deadbolt is equivalent to a password prompt where you go in, you, you provide your password or you, you turn the key in the deadbolt that unlocks the door and then you're let in. Most houses though, don't have any additional security. What Plurlock is doing is, is we're acting uh, both as that deadbolt to let you into the house, but we're also effectively a motion sensor inside that house. Based on your specific motion, we can either lock or unlock all of the remaining doors in that house. And we can also provide a, a 911 call uh, if we detect an intruder. So we're really shifting the paradigm when it comes to authentication. We're moving from just a static one-off uh, or maybe one once or twice per day check to, to a much more continuous model. How does this technology work? Well, we're using a, a form of biometrics called behavioral biometrics. This is a way of identifying people based on their movement as opposed to a fingerprint or an iris scan or something that is more static. Um, our team is uh, comprised of world's experts um, specifically in this technology and behavioral biometrics. Uh, and the technology itself has undergone tens of thousands of hours of research. It's been peer reviewed in over 100 journal articles, received thousands of citations, uh, and we have six issued and provisional patents on this today. A good example of the specific nuances of, of what we are looking for um, are the speed, rhythm, and cadence of how you type on the keyboard. Everybody has their own speed, rhythm, and cadence as a result of things like how long your fingers are, how long your fingernails are, how did you learn to type originally, do you have bad habits? All of these get built up into a unique profile, usually takes a couple of weeks to build that profile. Once that profile is built, then we're doing checks every three to five seconds to validate that you are in fact the right person. On the mouse, uh, very similar, we're also looking at mouse behavior, how you move the mouse, do you, do you scroll quickly, do you move uh, kind of in a jerking fashion? Um, there are again micro expressions that we build up into that profile, which we're then able to use for authentication. So our strategy uh, as a corporation is that we have this technology division uh, where we build and market the, the SaaS uh, Pluralock technology. We are looking to grow both organically as well as inorganically, uh, so through M&A. And then we're seeking to cross sell uh, our owned technology through those, uh, through those acquisitions. So we've made one acquisition so far. Uh, in uh, April 1st of this year, we acquired a defense contractor called Aurora. Uh, they're based in, in Los Angeles, California. Reason we acquired Aurora was several fold, uh, but principally they have great distribution. They have over 140 customers. Uh, and uh, certainly you can see from our, our recent news uh, who some of those customers are. Uh, it's folks like the US Navy, the US Army, US Special Operations Command, um, also a good number of California state entities. Uh, worth pointing out also um, from a Canadian perspective, the California state uh, is the 
is the largest, um, it's the fifth largest economy in the world, uh, just that state alone. So it provides just a tremendously large market to go after on the state level, in addition to the US federal market, as well as the, uh, the West Coast commercial market. So Aurora had two master service agreements uh, that were noteworthy. The first was they have a soup contract, a NASA soup contract, which gives them a, an ability to sell into the US federal government, both civilian as well as defense. And then also a California CMAS contract, uh, which uh, again gives them access to sell into uh, California state agencies, of which there are uh, approximately 174. Um, last year, Aurora did approximately $28 million in sales. Um, we acquired Aurora for $1.5 million total uh, US, uh, of which $900,000 was in cash uh, and the remainder in stock and earnout. And so there are uh, hundreds to thousands of, of similar Aurora-like companies in North America. And this is a, this is a great example of, of, a type of, of a type of target uh, that we are looking to acquire, uh, be very disciplined uh, in terms of how we go out and, and do those acquisitions, um, and then ultimately uh, seek to, again, cross-sell our high-margin products. So part of the, uh, the financial uh, profile of Chloralock uh, historically prior to the acquisition was that we have as a, as a software uh, manufacturer, as an, as, as an OEM of software capabilities, uh, we have a, a very high gross margin. Um, the companies like Aurora typically are reselling uh, products and services. And so their gross margin is, is considerably less. And so the, again, the, the goal here, the plan is to be able to cross sell from the Pluralock technology division through the Pluralock solutions division to those customers um, uh, uh, of, the, of the acquired entity. Um, Pluralock is, is, uh, has a tremendous management team. Uh, some of them are shown here on the, on the slide. Uh, a couple of things that I would point out first, myself, uh, CTO, VP, product. Uh, we've all worked together at a venture-backed company uh, in the past called Terapeak. Terapeak was uh, eventually uh, successfully acquired by, um, by eBay. Um, Terapeak was, was really a data and analytics company. Uh, and I joke sometimes that we're, we're functionally doing the same thing here at Pluralock. We're using data and analytics to make security decisions as opposed to uh, the sort of work we were doing at Terapeak. Um, the finance team is led by Roland Sartorius, very experienced both in public companies as well as M&A. Uh, sitting behind uh, Roland, uh, very experienced M&A team as well as public company uh, finance team. Uh, our data science team led by Dr. Uh, Nakabe, um, he was one of the very early pioneers in behavioral biometrics um, and, uh, and world-class uh, in terms of the uh, machine learning and, and data science capabilities. Uh, so we're very fortunate to, to have that capability in-house as part of the team. And then uh, Philip D'Souza, former owner of Aurora, uh, he's very uh, excited about the opportunity uh, post acquisition. And so he is currently leading the, uh, the solutions uh, division for Pluralock. Um, on the board of directors, we've, we've been uh, blessed to have a, a number of uh, cybersecurity luminaries uh, on the team. Uh, I won't go through all of them here, but um, two people I would call out uh, with special attention. First, Admiral Mike McConnell. Um, who's been a, a director of Pluralock for many years, um, even pre-public, pre he was uh, uh, our lead independent director for many years. Admiral McConnell was the former director of the NSA. Uh, he was also director of national intelligence. So that was a position created after 9-11 that had all of the US intelligence agencies roll up to that role. And then Admiral McConnell would then brief the president on a daily basis in the Oval Office. Um, after Admiral McConnell left, uh, government service, he went to Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, a large defense contractor, where he scaled their cybersecurity practice from uh, millions to uh, a very large number and ultimately helped take Booz Allen public. Um, we've also uh, uh, been very fortunate to have Ed Hammersley uh, uh, as part of our, our independent uh, director. Uh, he formerly ran the uh, cybersecurity division at Raytheon, so another defense contractor. Um, and helped uh, spin out uh, Forcepoint, which was a, a large cybersecurity um, uh, OEM. Um, a couple of recent additions also to the Board of Advisors. Um, I'd call out uh, specifically Admiral Jan Tai. Uh, so Admiral Tai, um, uh, or actually Dr. Tai as well, 
um, very, very experienced cryptologist. She has a PhD in electrical engineering. She was also um, uh, an early member of uh, US Cyber Command and was also at NSA. Uh, and currently she is a full board member at, uh, at Goldman Sachs. So I'll, I'll touch upon the uh, the cap table here. So uh, there's a couple of different dates here. So just, just to keep that in mind. So we originally went public um, on uh, September 24th. Uh, so almost exactly a year ago, a year ago and, and I guess five days. So we listed as part of an RTO process, we listed at 30 cents. Um, and then as of September 1st, uh, share price is approximately 60 cents. I think we're, we're still approximately around there. So, so um, uh, um, uh, so very good uh, 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 progress over the last 12 months. And um, in terms of the, the overall market cap, we're sitting at approximately 35-ish million dollars, 37, um, 58 million shares outstanding. And we do have about 13 million warrants out um, some of those are at uh, 40 cents, uh, and the, the balance of those are at uh, 65 cents. So they represent approximately six and a half million dollars, uh, assuming full exercise. Um, and then uh, as of uh, our June 30th uh, set of financials, um, uh, have about 4.9 million dollars on the balance sheet. So we've, we've touched upon some of the key milestones that we have uh, accomplished uh, already during this presentation. Uh, but just to recap, um, so we, we listed uh, as part of the go public process in, uh, in Q3 2020, um, began trading on the TSXV. Uh, Q4 last year was really about preparing for growth, so strengthened the leadership team, also made, a, made a, a number of key product enhancements to be able to accommodate uh, a larger growth in, in terms of the actual product usage. In Q1 of this year, um, we cross-listed on the OTC QB exchange. And we also raised uh, $5.2 million. Um, it was done in uh, effectively two private placements, one at 45 cents and the second at 48 cents. And then in March announced a number of additional uh, patents to, to expand our competitive moat. Um, and then Q2, we acquired Aurora. Again, that was uh, $28 million uh, of the sales Aurora did last year to which we, we paid 1.5 million. Uh, and then in May, we filed a, a $50 million base shelf uh, prospectus. So in terms of comparable or similar companies out there, there's, there's really two ways that you can, you can look at Pluralock. The first is, is predominantly uh, Canadian-based uh, technology companies that have both a stated M&A growth strategy as well as proprietary intellectual property. Um, so certainly companies like Well Health, Converge, uh, Tribe, I mean, these are all, uh, you know, fantastic uh, uh, companies um, in Canada. And um, Plurlock is similar in the sense that we have uh, uh, proprietary intellectual property as well as a, a growth strategy that encompasses m and um, As you get into the United States, you see more um, uh, pure play cybersecurity companies, um, but they're typically of a, of a larger size. And so one of the things that I frequently hear is that Pluralock uh, is, is really one of the only um, uh, emerging stories when it comes to cybersecurity. And I think the reason for that is, is traditionally cybersecurity companies stay private for many years. They raise uh, capital through traditional venture capitalists. And so they're not as accessible to, uh, to the public markets uh, until they until they're much more mature, much more advanced, and so Pluralock is is bucking the trend a little bit there, uh, in in so much as we we opted to go public much earlier, um, as opposed to as opposed to wait till later. Uh, so with that, you know, just brief recap: we're in a a, a very large market. Uh, you know, cybersecurity, uh, from my perspective, is is not going away anytime soon. Um, again, I think our our business strategy is is a little bit more unique. I think that we're, we're not looking to rebuild, uh, rebuild the wheel. We're, we're very much focused on growth through, uh, through acquisition and realizing synergies. Um, as well, uh, you know, from, from our news flow, as, as you've seen, we've been uh, signing up customers like financial institutions, both domestically as well as internationally, uh, as well as extensive work in, um, uh, in the federal space, both civilian defense as well as uh, state 
uh, state and local. And the, the thing that really differentiates Plurlock from, from anybody else is this patented artificial intelligence capability, being able to identify people continuously, um, as well as having a, a world-class leadership team. So with that, I might turn it back to, to yourself, Prit, and, and just see if we've had any questions develop over the, the course of the presentation. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as discussed earlier in the presentation, if you do have any questions, you can submit them to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you are dialing in today, you can submit them to info, I-N-F-O, at thesiscapital.ca. Uh, with that out of the way, let's move into the Q&A portion. So first question, how do you deal with a new user that has no historic profile? Yeah, very good question. So we go through a period of enrollment where we're observing what is a, a normal steady state for that user. Um, this can be bundled into uh, when a new employee is added to the organization. So as an example, there's generally some HR processes that occur. You get your badge, you get issued your new computer, you, you create your accounts. Um, and then during that process, you're also enrolled into the, the Plurlock system. Crucially, we don't need the end user to do anything extra. We want them to just go about their regular day. If they're gonna do email, do email. If they're gonna be in Excel, do Excel. If they're gonna be programming, do that. It's whatever the, the regular activity is. Also, for us, it doesn't matter what language they're, they're typing in. So they could be writing in English, they could be writing in French, they could be doing a mixture of both. We, we don't actually look at the contents of what somebody is doing. We only look at the behavior of their activity, which also makes it a whole lot more privacy friendly. So unlike a, a security camera that, uh, you know, is just looking at you and looking at what you do and, and can be perceived as quite invasive, Plurlock is actually perceived as a much more privacy friendly solution simply because we don't need to look at those contents. Um, but that's broadly speaking, the, the process, we, we just observe passively in the background, the users go about their regular day, and that's how those profiles are created. Um, the, the other workflow uh, that we typically get questions around is what happens if a user uh, uh, breaks their hand, right? They go skiing, they break their wrist or whatever. Um, it's treated the same way as a, as a lost or stolen password. You simply reset the password, we reset the profile, they re-enroll their profile, and then if that behavior is fundamentally different, then we can just use that um, on a go-forward basis. We don't find that different keyboards uh, or different mice really produce that much variability. We do have some proprietary ways of, of working with multiple keyboards for a single person. As an example, I have a I'm on my laptop today. I have an external keyboard as well. Both of those roll up to a single keyboard profile for me, but we do have some nuances around those individual devices. But that's part of the proprietary nature of, of, uh, of what we do. Perfect. So, you know, great follow up to that. Uh, as an existing user, if you have a new mouse or keyboard with a different key configuration, how would that work? So the only times where, where we, would, um, we would produce different profiles is if you had... Um, uh, in the 90s, there was, uh, uh, there was uh, different types of keyboards that had a QWERTY style versus a, what they called a Dvorak style. So QWERTY is the way that keyboards are typically laid out today. Dvorak was, was uh, um, I think it's still used a, a little bit, but Dvorak keyboards were laying out the keys in a different way to try and make typing faster. Um, so in, in those cases, you know, there, those, those edge cases do present... Um, some opportunities for us to, to, to do a little bit of, of, of a different way of computing that individual. Um, but generally speaking, if it's one QWERTY keyboard, if it's a second QWERTY keyboard, and the spring tension is different, that, that different nuance is not enough to, to really cause us any grief. And in fact, those are part of the things that we're looking for um, when we're profiling those individual keyboards. Perfect. What expansion opportunities does Pluralog have with existing customers? So, you know, I think this is a perhaps a good time to talk about Aurora and kind of the, you know, the value chain uh, with a customer. So it's a good question. If we're talking about uh, an existing Pluralog technology group customer, we do have two products. Uh, so we have an initial authentication product called Pluralog Adapt and then our continuous authentication or flagship product called Pluralog Defend. And so there's certainly an opportunity to cross sell both of those two products to, to one another's customers. We can, we can sell a defend customer, the adapt product and vice versa. Or in some cases, um, we may have a customer who just wants both at the same time. I think that the, the more interesting customer journey for me is if we look at, um, if we look at an Aurora customer, 
uh, who, you know, maybe, maybe purchased some resale uh, hardware initially, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a small thing, but, you know, a couple hundred um, uh, licenses or, or maybe, maybe a firewall, right? That's the initial contact with that person. That, that, the margin on the sale like that would be quite low, as we saw from the slides earlier, you know, it might be a 5% gross margin. But the, the value there is to be able to get into that customer, prove that we can deliver, prove that we are a good partner for them, and ultimately prove that we want a longstanding relationship with them. So from that initial sale of, let's say, a firewall, we might then uh, upsell them to some sort of services offering. Hey, we helped you with your firewall. Can we provide a security assessment for you? Can we provide some security remediation or a pen test? That services, that might be more at a, at a 40, 50, 60% gross margin. Um, and so we're starting to both increase the lifetime value of that customer. We're also increasing the blended margin for that customer. And then the goal um, from my perspective is, is certainly if we can get from, from those initial touch points, if we can then get them into the Pluralock Defend product, well, now we're talking about closer to an 85, 88% gross margin product that, that typically will be on a recurring basis. So it's not about uh, it's not about replacing um, uh, you know the low margin stuff with the higher margin stuff. It's really about how do we create a longstanding relationship with that customer? How do we create a high degree of repeatability? How do we create a longstanding relationship? How do we solve problems for that customer? And ultimately, we should see that reflected in numbers uh, in in terms of the the growth both in LTV as well as blended GM. Great. Um... As mentioned earlier, if you do have any questions, you can submit them to the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're calling in today, you can submit them at info at thesiscapital.ca. Next question. Have you thought of selling a touch-sensitive keyboard to add another layer of protection? Uh, great question. I, I think that there are a number of expansion opportunities. I think that's that would certainly be, um, be one of them. Um, our, uh, our research division or excuse me, our research department um, is very active about thinking about what's next. Uh, and so looking about what are the emerging capabilities that are coming online, um, even that are being bundled into the next generation laptops and desktops, et cetera, mobile devices as well. Um, we did have a, a number of um, uh, research projects which were funded by the Canadian government around touchscreen, uh, mobile capabilities, et cetera, and, and leveraging some of those newer generation sensors in terms of adding those signals to our authentication algorithms and models. So we're absolutely very focused on that. I think today what I would say is that our, our core customer is, is still uh, very concerned about traditional people working on desktops, people working on laptops, eight hours a day, five days a week, and they're dealing with sensitive data. And, and they, they're trying to solve for that first. Um, and that's really where, where we're spending uh, the majority of our, of our sales time uh, as, as we still are observing those, those next generation trends coming down the pipe. Great. Uh, in recent months, it appears a number of new sales contracts for Pluralock's cybersecurity software is accelerating. Is this a sign that the company's investment in sales staff is paying off? Based on this recent success, what are your expectations where sales will be next year? Not just in the US, but also potentially in the EU, Asia, or anywhere else abroad? Yeah, it's a very good question. And I think this, this um, draws back to what we said we were going to do at the beginning of the year. Uh, so we uh, in February, we raised the, the $5.2 million. And we said the use of proceeds for that was both to invest in our organic uh, direct sales operation, as well as be able to act on uh, M&A opportunities. Um, and we did both. We, we did hire some additional sales staff, sales and sales support, as well as we executed on Aurora. So I think our track record uh, is pretty good of, of being able to deliver on the things that we said that we were going to do. Um, and the timing is also correct. Um, you know, typically the average sales cycle for IT or cybersecurity products like ours is going to be around six months. Once you have somebody who is trained, once you have a salesperson who's trained, understands the product, is able to manage objections, from the point at which a customer says, look, I need help to that deal actually getting done, usually about six months. That's an average, it can be faster, it can be slower. Typically it'll slow down if the deals are larger in size. 
Um, but if you if you plot that timeline, we said we were going to invest a little bit in in the spring. We made that investment, and so now we're seeing some some of the results of that investment. And so I think that that those are um, certainly in line with with what we hoped would would happen when we when we made those hires. Um, I think the in terms of looking looking ahead, we haven't published any formal guidance today on on what revenue is going to be. I would say, just broadly speaking, geographically, we are we are continued to be very focused on North America. Um, the, the North American market is massive. Just the U.S. federal space alone uh, consumes a tremendous amount of, of IT products, um, and so we don't need we don't necessarily need to expand internationally in order to. Um, to, to get the kind of results that we are hoping for. Specifically with the overseas financial institution that we announced a couple of weeks ago, um, that was a result of an inbound opportunity. So we weren't focused on going outbound to Europe, Asia, Africa, um, but we're certainly uh, receptive to uh, financial institutions asking for help saying, look, we need what you have, can you, can you help us? So I think that the majority, I, I, I would say that the majority of our focus uh, is going to continue to be North America for for the next foreseeable um, future. Um, we're certainly looking at other um, both English speaking markets as well as also friendly markets to the U.S. Um, you know, I think whenever you're talking about cybersecurity, th there there is a, a perception that you know, are you are you doing business in um, in regions that are geopolitically friendly with your domestic governments, with with you know, friendly with the United States, friendly with Canada. Um, and so certainly that that plays into it as well. Perfect. Uh, what kind of process is needed to come up with a Pluralock technology sale for, from the initial contact with the customer to the testing required to ensure uh, the software actually works to the customer's capabilities? Yeah, very good question. So similar to, uh, again, how other cybersecurity products or IT products are, are purchased, generally speaking, um, a, a customer will have either a a stated problem or a stated roadmap um, could be two things. So the, the driver for a, a sale of either a Pluralock product or, or similar product is going to be, um, we've had a breach and we need to remediate that breach, or we there's some new uh, regulatory compliance that we wanna stay ahead of, or um, maybe there's just a, a best practice desire look, we need to be more secure. We know that we need to reduce the risk internally to the company and therefore we need to do something. So it could be could easily be one of those three drivers. It could be others as well, but those are the three most common. From there, we'll, we'll identify with the customer what is the problem they're actually trying to solve and specifically, what is the risk they're trying to mitigate? Is there uh, a large workload of sensitive data where maybe a call center inside a bank has access to customer personally identifiable information? That's both a security risk, it's also a massive regulatory risk. And so they may need additional controls um, for anybody accessing that data. Could also be that maybe it's sensitive systems. Uh, so we just recently renewed a, a hedge fund client uh, in New York and certainly, you know, large, large financial institutions like that are, are very sensitive about the algorithms that they use for trading. So maybe these are, uh, you know, billion dollar algorithms and they want to make absolutely sure anybody who's making changes to those algorithms are who they say they are. And, and so that might be a good use case for us as well. So we'll go through that period of discovery where we're working with that customer. We're, we're trying to identify what is, what is the right fit look like? Um, from there, we're almost always doing a, either a proof of concept or some sort of evaluation of our software in their environment with their customers on their hardware. So it, it's it's quite common to have um, to have somebody say, "Look, sure, it works over there, it works over here, it works with that financial institution, it works with that pharma company, but we're different, right? And here's why." And so we're generally going to go through and actually validate that with their specific. Um, uh, technology stack with with their laptops with the software they already run. There's not any conflicts uh, that it it works as as expected, etc. And then they also get a chance to evaluate the performance. So, like we were mentioning earlier in, in the conversation with that financial institution, you know they were satisfied that they could reliably detect an intruder within about a minute of that intruder taking over an account, and um, and so they were they were satisfied with that, and that ultimately led to. Uh, to a sale, and the sale process is generally going to be going through procurement, potentially legal as well, depending on the organization, um, and then from there actually getting the, the contract signed 
And then once that contract is signed, then we would start the actual deployment process where either we're working with them or they're going to do it themselves or we do it for them. Um, and that can be very short. Uh, it could be a little bit longer if it's part of a larger initiative within a customer's organization. Uh, so if they're trying to roll out 12 different security products of which we are one of them, you know, then we might slot into that existing roadmap. So, you know, broadly speaking, that's a, that can be around a six month process, uh, which again is pretty typical for the industry. Great. Um, next question. Are there any other companies with similar behavioral biometric software or is Pluralock alone in this field? So very good question. There are other companies with behavioral biometrics. Um, the, the two most notable ones that have been around the longest uh, are called BioCatch, which is an Israeli company and just recently moved over their headquarters to New York, I believe, and Behaviosec, which is uh, originally from Sweden um, and, and uh, quite well known in the, um, uh, in the European market. Um, you know, from, from our perspective, those companies are, are tremendous in terms of being able to protect the um, uh, the customers who are logging into their online accounts. So we consider that more of a of a fraud prevention use case, um, whereby uh, they're trying to make sure that an attacker hasn't gotten one of their customers log in, be able to then log into their online bank account, transfer transfer money around. Uh, or, or what have you. Pluralock is, is more focused on the employees of a bank or of, a, of an institution. And so the technology needed for those two different use cases look very different, right? The one you're dealing more with, with websites and installing stuff on, on the websites to protect the, a larger number of people coming in for a shorter amount of time versus what we're doing, which is we're deployed on the, the actual laptop itself or, or the, the desktop itself, and we're looking at a smaller total number of users, um, but at a much longer time period. So again, we're looking at the employees uh, of a bank and we're focused on um, eight hours a day, five days a week um, for maybe a couple thousand employees as opposed to a five minute interaction for uh, you know, 20,000 customers. So that's principally the key difference, um, but really good validation that those um, that there are other companies out there who are building businesses around uh, behavioral biometrics. It's great validation of this type of technology. And certainly, um, uh, you know, there are, there are others, um, I'm sure there are others out there as well. Great. Um, looking forward to 2022, what is the pace of acquisitions that is anticipated and what is the profile of those potential M&A targets? So we've cast a very wide net. I think that we, we mentioned in a, in a past corporate update that we have um, uh, a, a robust M&A pipeline. We're looking at uh, companies who could slot into both the solutions division as well as the technology division. Um, from my perspective, there are hundreds, if not thousands of uh, companies similar to Aurora that have great customer relationships. and who ultimately are looking for avenues to increase their own profitability. Um, and so that's, that's really a good win-win for, for Pluralock, who's looking for distribution. And we have uh, products that, um, that command a much higher gross margin. So, so that would, just broadly speaking, that would be one type of target. You know, we're also, we're, we're open and receptive to, um, to looking at bolt-ons in the technology division that could accelerate our product roadmap. Um, you know, if it's, if it happens to be cheaper to acquire um, a feature or maybe an integration um, that gives us an ability to uh, increase the, the deployment of our technology, um, that that's certainly something that we're going to look at. Um, but I think that we're going to be uh, a little bit more focused on on the the distribution targets, the sales acceleration targets um, that that we think would come from the uh, from the solutions division. Uh, having said that, what I would say is that um, from my perspective, you know, Aurora was was a great transaction uh, for for all parties involved. I think that the Aurora team is also very uh, uh, they've been very positive. Um, we did, I did a podcast with the the former owner and now president Philip. Uh, and, and he was saying that the team is, is very happy about the, the new arrangement. Um, we've been investing into that business. Um, and I think that we're starting to see the results from that. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that there are other 
similar transactions that we could do in the future. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll continue to be very thoughtful about how do we disciplinely um, uh, allocate capital. Great. Um, next question here. What is Pluralog's endgame? Is it to be the next Microsoft or Amazon? <laughs> or do you expect to be bought out at some point? That'd be nice. <laughs> Um, so great question, Derek. I, you know, I think we've only just gone public a year ago. Like it's it's still very early days. I I, I think what I would say is uh, both the management team as well as the leadership team um, and really the the stakeholders uh, of the company uh, are are very ambitious and and we're looking to help customers stay secure. I don't think there's going to be any shortage of that. I I personally don't see uh, uh, you know an end to the number of of customers who are getting hacked from the number of customers who need better security. And frankly, for, for, the, for the industries out there that need new ways of thinking about authentication and going from a, a, a kind of a static paradigm where you're, you're manually proving your identity to the computer to much more of a continuous model, that's frankly much more convenient, right? Part, part of the other benefit about the way that we do what we do is being able to do it invisibly without <clears throat> the users knowing that it's taking place or without them uh, having to do any any extra work in order to prove the identity. So, so from my perspective, if we're able to provide a easier to use security solution that's also more secure and doesn't require any special hardware like a fingerprint reader would. That's, so it's gonna be cheaper because there's no hardware involved. It seems like that has a, a tremendous amount of, of uh, longevity uh, in terms of places that we could take that. And so we're just focused on, on, uh, on, the, on building the business right now. And, and um, uh, you know, I don't think there's gonna be any shortages of, of customers to go after. Great. Um... I've mentioned earlier, if you do have any questions, you can submit them uh, to the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, if you are calling in today, you can submit them by email to info, I-N-F-O, at thesiscapital.ca. Uh, next question here. Can your product be combined with a product that works for 20,000 short-term users? Yeah, so I think I think the question ultimately is, um, you know, we talked about the different types of uh, behavioral biometrics companies. So I mentioned Behaviosec and Biocatch, two two fantastic companies that are out there um, playing in a similar space. And so the question is, could Pluralock expand from the uh, end user employee authentication that we do today? Could we expand into more of the fraud prevention space that the other behavioral biometrics companies are are in today? And I think the answer is absolutely yes. That's certainly an expansion opportunity. We would see that that's more of an adjacent uh, adjacent field. Again, it's not directly competitive to what we do today, but could provide an additional market. I would also say that um, going a little bit down market is also an, an, another uh, expansion opportunity that we could pursue. So Pluralock today, uh, we, we generally want to target organizations, 500 employees and above, and really you know, thousands to tens of thousands of employees is kind of the sweet spot for, for where we like to play today. But that leaves a tremendous amount of small businesses and even just individuals who might want to have a Pluralock capability on their desktop themselves. You know, if, if you're working from home and, and you're a um, solo entrepreneur and you've got kids in the house and you want to know if the kids are on your laptop, um, absolutely. I mean, that's that's a great use case uh, that Pluralock could go after. So I think that the the expansion opportunities for us are um, are both to go down market to that SMB and, and solopreneur uh, market, which we, we don't have any offerings for today. We can also go up market and really target the, the much larger Fortune 100 sized cor corporations of the hundreds of thousands of employees, because we're not focused there. We can also go uh, kind of laterally, we can move uh, to other geographies, which again, we're not focused on today, other than things coming in down. And then we can also go into other product categories like the fraud prevention uh, product category uh, previously mentioned. So all of those are perfectly valid. Um, and I think provide uh, just a, a tremendous amount of, of future opportunities should we wish to uh, should we wish to go after those. Today, I would say that we're, we're laser focused on getting very very good um, at this this mid market in North America, primarily regulated industries, um, and and there's enough there uh, to keep us busy. We don't have to uh, uh, divert focus at this point 
to those other markets, but we're, we're excited that they exist and, and certainly provide opportunity for the future. Great. Um, what are the prospects of moving from the TSXV to a potential NASDAQ or uplifting to the TSX next year or even beyond? Yeah, I, th- I think the, the the opportunities are great. I mean, we've, we've had a, a very positive experience uh, on the TSX venture. Certainly, um, there are, uh, you know, I've seen a, a number of other companies just uplist recently from the TSX V to the, to the full TSX. Um, we also have... Uh, you know, the, the bulk of our business is in the United States. Um, when, when you look at it from a revenue perspective, when you look at it just from a focus perspective, we build products in Canada and then we export those primarily to the United States. And so I think having a, uh, a, a U.S. listing um, certainly makes sense because we're spending a lot of our time there. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll go back to some of the, the uh, both board of advisors as well as board of directors. Um, you know, we've got a lot of shared experience with, with um uh, ties to the to the U.S. capital markets. So, look, it's it's certainly a great opportunity, um, and I think that uh, we're we're actively reviewing uh, you know all of those as part of our of our broader capital market strategy. Perfect. Um, so going back to the margins, some margins seem thin, and other products have healthier margins. How do you see optimizing margin with a client? What would a healthy target margin look like? So. I think this just goes back to uh, the two core parts of the business and, you know, the customer journey and effectively how we, you know, take one customer and turn them into a higher margin client. But, you know, I'll let you answer that. Ian. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think if you just look at it from a financial perspective, you're absolutely right. Some, some of the offerings that we have today are very low margin and some of them are, are considerably higher. And so ultimately what we're trying to do is solve for the customer. What does the customer need? How can we establish a relationship with that customer and how can we keep the relationship with that customer? So that's, that's really where we're, where, where we're focused on. And, and our thesis is that if we are able to provide <clears throat> more products and services to that customer, if we can become that trusted advisor that they turn to whenever they have any cybersecurity concerns, problems, purchases, that ultimately that will lead to a, a greater likelihood that we can then sell the highest margin capability, which would be the Pluralock Defend and Pluralock Adapt Adapt products. The way that that will probably transpire is that they will start with something that is uh, relatively more commoditized because they'll have they'll have a, a greater need for um, or a greater frequency of purchase for those commoditized products. That will likely become that that initial purchase. From there, if we can then expand that relationship, if we can cross-sell um, services, as an example, we develop a much a much deeper insight into that customer environment. And then from that insight, that'll then enable us to then offer uh, the, the, the higher margin SaaS products. So could it happen in a different order? Could we start with the SaaS products? Could we then sell them a firewall? And then could we then sell them some services? Absolutely. This is not a, a purely linear um, linear motion. But the, the, the comparison here is we, we spent $1.5 million to, to buy Aurora. And really, we spent $900,000 of cash US to, to buy Aurora. And with that, we, we bought a, a base of customers, uh, a sales force, and tremendous relationships with those end customers. If we wanted to recreate those, if, if, we, if we didn't want to do the model that I just described, if we wanted to recreate distribution, the alternative would be we would spend probably more money, um, you know, maybe a couple million dollars hiring a direct sales force. We would, uh, uh, it's a very competitive market today, as we saw cybersecurity jobs, three and a half million unfilled. So we, we would most likely have to spend a large amount of dollars to get that talent into the company and then to be able to retain them. We would then have to build those customer relationships um, because if we're if we're just hiring a new sales rep, they may have a Rolodex, but there's probably going to be a non-compete from their last job. So they can't go back to the exact same customers they were just dealing with. So, so they'll have to build those new relationships. Then they'll have to understand the customer environment. Then they'll have to then go into that six-month sales, sales focus. So um, so from a dollar's perspective, the, 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 the question is, which one is, is the most uh, efficient use of capital? But then it's also, there's a time element as well. If we, if we build instead of buy, if we build that, 
it, there, there's going to be a longer lead time on recruiting. There's going to be a longer lead time we feel on developing the, those customer relationships. And then, and then we're starting into the sales process. And so we, we just think that uh, it makes more sense on this, on this acquisition model. Um, plus, we also have the benefit of the accretive revenue. Uh, you know, Aurora was roughly break even. Uh, and so it's so it's not it's not dragging down um, overall net income EBITDA uh, necessarily. And so ultimately, we just feel that that's that's the right model again for the customers and for the industry that we're in. And that's really again where we where we started from, which was what we said: look, what is the right thing to do for customers in order for them to be successful? And that's how we've arrived at where we are. Perfect. Um, are there any plans in licensing out the technology to other solutions? Seems like a simple integration to EDR. Like like CrowdStrike. Uh, so great question. I, I think that licensing certainly could be an additional expansion opportunity. Um, uh, you know, CrowdStrike. I think Sentinel One also uh, would be you know another great EDR company that's out there. I think just recently uh, listed as well. Um, absolutely. I mean, look, the, the the great thing about being in the position that we are is that there are so many expansion opportunities uh, to to add revenue. We can add through the licensing. We can add through, uh, you know, and going up market, down market, left, right, expanding laterally, adjacencies. So it's just a, it's a tremendous opportunity. So I, I would say that we don't have a um, uh, we don't have a large focus on pursuing uh, licensing opportunities. But I think as you've seen uh, us demonstrate so far. We had some inbound opportunities come in from overseas. We were not focused there, um, but we realized that that was a great opportunity. And so we acted on that. And so similarly, um, you know, we're always receptive to, to folks who, who, who come to us and say, look, there's, there's an opportunity to do X, to do Y. Uh, and so we'd certainly uh, review that if that came out. Perfect. Uh, are you looking at other industries aside from government, financial, and healthcare? Yeah, um, so the short answer is yes. Um, again, it comes down to focus. So for us, we are we are currently laser focused on our outbound efforts in North America, mid market, and predominantly regulated industries. And regulated is federal, defense, financial services, healthcare, education to a certain extent as well. That doesn't mean there aren't great opportunities with hospitality, where there's a lot of turnover and staff. It also doesn't mean that there's a lot of opportunities with critical infrastructure, power plants, right, or even manufacturing. Um, I, I would just say that we're more focused on those regulated use cases. If we had somebody come in inbound to us, uh, you know, from a hotel, for instance, and they were really concerned about front desk access, or um, you know, we see we see frequently anytime you have a, a, a an open office concept where there are just uh, devices that are left unattended. And not behind physical security, that all pre also presents great opportunity for us. So we we would certainly work with those customers. But again, from an outbound perspective, where we're where we're spending our time going outbound, where we're looking for acquisition opportunities that overlap with our target market, we're more focused on that on that kind of bullseye. And so if there are opportunities that are you know not in the bullseye but still on the board, certainly we're gonna we're gonna look at those um, as well. Perfect. Uh... So if you have any more questions, I think we only have a couple minutes here. Um, you can submit them to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen again, or you can email us at info at thesiscapital.ca. Um, how is, uh, let's talk about adopt and defend quickly, um, user growth. Um, how is that looking? Yeah, I would say positive. You know, I think between the two products, um, the, the adapt product, that initial authentication product. So using again, the house analogy, that's the deadbolt on the front door versus defend is the motion sensor inside the house. I would say that defend is, is certainly the one that we lead with. It's also the one that is, is more different relative to other solutions that are out there. There, there are certainly great, uh, MFA products, multi-factor authentication products that exist today. So Duo would be one example. They were acquired by Cisco for, I think, $2.4 billion a couple of years ago. Okta, right, another great um, MFA capability. Microsoft Azure also has a great MFA capability. These are all those initial, uh, initial access, initial points of access or authentication. And so the, the Adapt product uh, is also similar to that. I would say that Adapt is more directly competitive with a Duo or an Azure or an Okta or, or, or similarly, um, but it's a defined segment, right? So, so if, if somebody says, look, I need MFA because I've got budget and I, I have to solve this in order to get my cybersecurity insurance renewed, 
uh, which we're seeing more and more come up, or look, I need this to pass my regulatory compliance audit. Um, that might be a case where we have a, a, a customer call us and say, look, we need adapt because we want your version because it's easier to use than these other versions. So that might be where we see growth there. The defend product is, is, is a new, it's a new category. And so the way that I describe it is adapt fits into the existing MFA category. Defend is a category creator. There, there is no existing category for continuous authentication capabilities. So it, it can be a more, more sophisticated sale um, where there's a little bit more education because there's no direct like-for-like uh, -like competitor, but there's also potential um, for, for more of a green field uh, where there's no clear incumbent and therefore, uh, you know, we can go after that market share um, relatively unimpeded by an 800 pound gorilla who's already got a, a stranglehold on the market. So, so they're, they're a little bit different. Um, I would say broadly speaking that we're more focused on the defend product. Um, and also we, we receive more interest, I would say in the defend product again, simply because it is, um, it is a category creator. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a new capability unto itself. Um, having said all of that, you know, I think that the more that we are successful, I think the more likely we're going to have competitors pop up behind us, you know, as we blaze a trail, uh, it's more likely that we're going to have other copycats come up or, or other similar capabilities um, come into the field. Um, and so for that reason, you know, we just need to be um, we need to be aggressive and we need to move uh, quickly. And we also need to make sure that we develop that competitive moat, right? And that's a combination of trade secrets because what we do is exceptionally difficult. You know, we're, we're basically, it's kind of like magic if you think about it. I mean, we're, we're identifying people based on their speed of how they type. Um, so that's a non-trivial machine learning exercise to do. But then at the same time, we're also building that patent portfolio uh, as well. Great. So it looks like we're running out of time here, but before we um, uh, end the webinar here, so Ian, last question, what should investors be excited about over the next 12 months? Well, I think that, uh, um, you know, we're, we're really excited about the existing organic opportunities, both from the Plurilock technology group side, as well as the solutions group through Aurora. And, um, you know, we've, we've had a, a, a very active pipeline of, of news coming out, uh, you know, with, with contract wins, et cetera. The, the one thing that I would just just sort of general um, knowledge is that um, when you're dealing with government, uh, they typically have a different fiscal year end. So when you're talking about California state, their fiscal year end is in Q2. The U.S. federal government, their fiscal year end is Q3. Um, and then Q1 and Q2 is generally where we spend more of our time on the commercial markets. So there is some seasonality, some cyclical nature of you know, who, who are the segments that we go after at what time of year. So I think that's, that's one thing when you're thinking about, uh, about what's coming up. Um, you know, I think we've also said uh, publicly that we have a very, uh, very active M&A pipeline. Um, and so we're focused on, on inorganic growth as well as uh, very full uh, organic sales pipelines. And so we're focused there as well. And so um, I would say to, to any shareholder and to any investor, you know, focus on, on looking at, at us execute on that plan. Um, you know, we, we believe that we have a, a sound strategy and we believe that that strategy uh, is starting to, to show some, some results. Uh, and so I, I, would, I would ask people to, to hold us accountable uh, to that strategy uh, as we go forward. Perfect. So Ian, thank you for being with us today. So this is Plurlock Security, uh, trading on the TSX Venture under the ticker Plur, P-L-U-R, on the OTCQB under the ticker P-O-C-K-F. I'm Prit Singh, founder of Thesis Capital. Again, Ian, thanks for taking the time today. Thanks, Britt. Thanks, everybody.